we come to our final letter to the seven churches, written to the church at Laodicea, and our reading comes from Revelation chapter 3, and verses 14 to 22. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I wonder if you've ever heard of the frog in the kettle experiment. It describes a frog slowly being boiled alive. That if a frog is suddenly put into boiling water, it will jump out. But if the frog is put into tepid water, which was then brought to the boil slowly, it will not realise the danger and eventually gets cooked to death. This story is often used as a metaphor to describe the inability or unwillingness of people to react to threats which arise gradually rather than suddenly. And unfortunately the church in Laodicea, like the frog in the kettle, slowly adjusted to the cultural attitudes, the secular environment of the day and became content with it. It was characterised by spiritual apathy. Jesus says they're not cold or hot, but lukewarm or tepid. The conditions that existed in each of the seven churches and the, the, the challenges that the seven churches faced on different levels with different degrees. But as Jesus writes to them, he brings them challenges. And today with the church at Laodicea, they are warned about being lukewarm. The place, the city of Laodicea, was founded in about 250 BC. And the word Laodicea means people's rights. The Laodiceans felt their Christianity should not impose on their personal liberties, their personal rights. The location of the city was about 11 miles from the city of Colossae. And the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the, to the Colossian church. And in it he mentioned the city of Laodicea four times. Laodicea was by the river. There were two rivers, Lycus and Meander. It had a claim to fame, a city of industrial prosperity and wealth. It was, a, it was a real, really a banking centre and was known for its woollen industry as well. This made it wealthy, even self-sufficient, and yet this caused some of its problems as well. Laodicea, a very self-sufficient self and independent city. The church had not impacted society, but had been impacted by society. They had not transformed the environment around them, but the environment around them had transformed it. Laodicea was the wealthiest of the seven cities, but also had a problem with its water supply. And at one time, an aqueduct was built to bring water into the city from hot springs. However, by the time 
the water reached the city, it was neither warm nor cold, but only lukewarm, which summed up this church. Laodicea was lukewarm. Having a drink that's lukewarm isn't very pleasant. We either want a drink that's hot or a drink that's cold. But it was clear there's a level of disgust shown towards this church here. We drink something that's lukewarm, we often want to spit it out. The believers did not take a stand for anything and therefore indifference had set in. The church had neglected doing things for Christ and had become hardened and self-satisfied. It was destroying itself. Being a Christian, but only in name. When we're like this, there's no fruit in our lives. People can't see the influence of Jesus in us. That fruit isn't evident to people. Sometimes we can say or even do the right things, but our hearts are not right. They are warned that God would discipline this lukewarm church unless it turned from its indifference and turned back towards him. God's purpose in discipline is not to punish, but to bring people back to him. God uses loving discipline for us when we choose to go our own way. And yes, we experience the consequences of our sin. But God wants to restore us to him. We can end up, we can avoid God's discipline by drawing near to him again, by choosing to repent. We can draw near in confession, in service, in worship and in studying his word. Do we ever feel that we're indifferent towards, <clears throat> indifferent towards going to church, indifferent towards the Bible? Have we started to shut God out of our life by being indifferent to him? By those times in his word not being things that excite us? Jesus was warned about being lukewarm, as well as there being no sitting on the fence. In fact, we read in Matthew 12, verse 30. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Perhaps we can think we're just indifferent to God. We're indifferent to it all. We know we're, we're happy for others to have their faith, but we're fairly indifferent to it. And we think, well, we're, we're neutral towards God. But we're told here we cannot be. We're either for him or against him. Can we ever fall into the trap of being a Christian just when it suits us? When things seem to be going well, when it's convenient, when it doesn't cause us too much difficulty, when we're with fellow believers, when the times are easy? We're called not to be lukewarm, but to look to be faithful all the time, to look to keep going. And to know that even in the challenges, even when we face opposition, we talked about the church at Philadelphia last week, even when they faced opposition, they stayed firm and they stood firm in their faith. Rather than being lukewarm and just having our faith when it suits us, we look to follow him all the time. The church was also self-reliant. We can fall into the trap of thinking that having lots of material possessions is a sign of God's blessing, and yet it is not. Laodicea, Laodicea was a wealthy city and the church was wealthy. However, people were more concerned about what they could see and what they could have themselves in, the, in this world than what is unseen and what is eternal. Laodicea was known for its great wealth, but Jesus told them to buy their gold from him. Was this meaning that Jesus was in the gold industry? He was selling them gold? No, of course not. He meant the spiritual, about the spiritual riches they could receive by turning to him. Far greater than what they had in this world. They had become self-sufficient. They relied on their own strength, their own wealth. The city was proud of its cloth and dyeing industries. But Jesus told them to purchase white clothes from him. Righteousness. Laodicea also took great pride in its precious eye salve that healed many eye problems. But Jesus told them not to put their trust in that, but to be healed, healed by him so their eyes would be opened. We read it in, in uh, John 9 verse 39. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see 
will become blind. They are being shown by Jesus that true value comes not in material possessions, but by having the right relationship with God. We read it in Ephesians 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For us, our achievements, possessions and wealth in this world is worthless compared to the riches that we are promised in God's future, in the future of God's kingdom. This church at Laodicea had become complacent and rich. They felt satisfied with themselves and with what they could do. But they did not have the presence of Jesus among them. They ignored his call because they were too busy enjoying their worldly pleasures. They did not notice his call. The temporary satisfaction and comfort of this world can sometimes bring us to a false sense of security. They were reliant on themselves and all they had around them instead of fixing their eyes on Jesus and trusting in what was unseen and in the eternal. Can that be easy for us today? To trust in what we have in front of us, in what we can see? Or do we trust in Jesus, in the eternal? And therefore, it's a reminder to let Christ fire up our faith. Just as the spark of love can be rekindled in a marriage, so the Holy Spirit can reignite our zeal for God when we allow him to have his way. It's what the church is called to do in verse 19. Although it can seem like a negative, a key to this is to remember they were asked to repent. They were called to turn back to Jesus. It means it was not too late for them. It's not too late for them to change their ways and to live for God once again. And that's a reminder for us as well. A theme that comes up a lot in these letters is for the churches to rekindle their faith, to turn back to God for ways in which they might have gone astray, ways in which they might have made their own choices, they could still come back to God. They can rediscover their love for their faith. And verse 20 is a, in many ways, <coughs> a classic verse, one which is often quoted. You might say people have pictures of it in their hallways. Jesus is knocking at the door of our hearts every time. Every time that we sense we should turn to him. Do we ever feel that desire to, to turn to him, to come back to him? Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Do we choose to open the door? Jesus is patient with us. He doesn't break the door down. He doesn't force his way in. The handle is on our side. It's for us to choose. Do we open it? Which side of the door would we prefer Jesus to be on? Do we want our faith to be reignited today if we feel it's gone cold? If we feel it's lukewarm? Like the church at Laodicea, they are told to allow God to reignite their faith. To turn back to him once again. To open the door and allow him to come in. Allow him to come into our hearts. Many of these churches are criticised throughout this, these letters. They're challenged about the way in which they're living. Sometimes they're reminded of the way they used to be and how they should come back to that. How much of this for us as Christians today is relevant? We look at ourselves as individuals and as churches. How much does it apply to us today? Do we feel as if our faith has gone cold? We've gone through the motions a bit. We've become self-sufficient. In spite of the rebukes, it's not too late for these churches. And it's not too late for us either. We can turn back to him and look to follow him more closely? Are we spiritually awake to what we need to do in our world today? Do we want to see our church, in our church, in our churches, in our communities and in this land being on fire for God in even greater ways? The church at Laodicea had become lukewarm. They were relying on themselves. They needed that fire to be rekindled to receive God once again. And so let us be challenged today to ask God to be with us and ask for that fire to be relit for our faith so we have that same passion and enthusiasm that we've always had. 
we've had in the past and that our faith grows. It grows stronger, it doesn't go cold, but we're on fire for God. Let us not be lukewarm, but burning with fire that shares our faith with others and that people see the love of Jesus in us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these messages that we receive in these letters to the churches. Forgive us for those times when our, our faith may have become lukewarm. And I pray that you can rekindle that fire in us for our faith, that same passion, that same enthusiasm, to share it with others. We pray that you'll be with each one of us. We pray that we'll be on fire for you in our lives, in our churches, in our communities, and in this land. In Jesus' name. Amen.